one, the hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30 minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners. So we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases, especially written, for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Brian Lynn, Susan Shand, and John Russell. Later, Kelly Jean Kelly will present America's Presidents. But first, Chinese President Xi Jinping promised Thursday to complete reunification with self ruled Taiwan. The Chinese leader made the comments during an hour long speech on the 100th anniversary of the ruling Chinese Communist Party. He also promised to stop any attempts by Taiwan to seek official independence. China considers democratically ruled Taiwan its own territory. And has increased efforts under Xi to defend its sovereignty claims. Those efforts include repeated flights by Chinese fighter planes and bombers close to the island. In his speech, Xi said, All sons and daughters of China must work together and move forward in solidarity, resolutely smashing. Any Taiwan independence plots. She also said anyone who tries to bully China will face broken heads and bloodshed. The unusually forceful language appeared to be an answer to criticism from the United States and other countries. Many nations have criticized China's trade and technology policies, military expansion, and human rights record. Taiwan's China Policymaking Mainland Affairs Council said the Communist Party had reached a certain economic development. But it said China remained a dictatorship that abused people's freedoms. And should accept democracy instead. The council also said Taiwan's people have rejected the One China principle, which states that the island is part of China. It added that China should give up its military threats and talk with Taiwan as equals. Our government's determination to firmly defend the nation's sovereignty and Taiwan's democracy and freedom, and to maintain peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait, remains unchanged. China has never ruled out the use of force to bring Taiwan under its control. She called for a process of peaceful reunification. But he also said that nobody should underestimate the Chinese people's ability to defend national sovereignty and territorial integrity. The government of the Republic of China withdrew to Taiwan in 1949 at the end of China's Civil War. The Chinese Communist Party took control of the mainland. The U.S. first recognized the government in Beijing in 1979. Most Taiwanese have shown no interest in being ruled by mainland China. Taiwan says only the island's people can decide their future, and have criticized Chinese pressure.
American comedian and actor Bill Cosby has been freed from prison after a court overturned his sexual assault conviction. Cosby was released from a Pennsylvania prison on Wednesday after the state's Supreme Court issued its ruling. He returned to his home near Philadelphia a short time later. The 83 year old Cosby had served nearly three years of a three to ten year sentence for drugging and sexually assaulting Andrea Constant at his home in 2004. Constant was Temple University's women's basketball administrator at the time of the assault. The state's highest court ruled that Cosby was unfairly prosecuted because a previous prosecutor, Bruce Castor, promised in 2005 that he would not be charged criminally over Constance's accusations. There was no evidence that the agreement was put in writing. Four Supreme Court justices formed the majority that ruled in Cosby's favor. Three others offered dissenting opinions. Cosby was charged criminally by Castor's successor, Kevin Steele, in 2015. Steele claimed that he was not required to observe the agreement made by Castor. But the Supreme Court disagreed. It found that Cosby depended on Castor's promise when he agreed to testify in a civil case brought by Constant. As part of that testimony, Cosby admitted offering substances to women he wanted to have sex with. But he said all the encounters were consensual. The civil case ended with Cosby settling with Constant for more than three million dollars. But when Cosby's testimony in the civil case was made public, Steele had Cosby arrested and brought criminal charges against him. In total, more than 60 women have come forward to say that Cosby sexually violated them and many accused him of unknowingly drugging them. Cosby was only charged in Constance's case because many of the incidents happened long ago and the statute of limitations had already run out. A statute of limitations is a law that prevents a suspect from being tried after a specific amount of time has passed. The charges in Constance's case were filed just days before the statute of limitations was about to run out. Cosby appeared with his legal team outside his home on Wednesday, but did not speak. One of his lawyers, Jennifer Bongian, said the comedian had served three years of an unjust sentence. Cosby smiled and moved his head when asked if he was happy to be home. Later, he posted a statement to his Twitter account thanking his supporters and saying, I have never changed my stance nor my story. I have always maintained my innocence. In a statement, Constant and her lawyers condemned the ruling. They, along with sexual assault victims and their supporters, expressed fear that the decision could discourage other victims from coming forward. We urge all victims to have their voices heard, the statement said. Cosby broke barriers in the 1960s as the first black actor to star in an American television network show. He went on to become hugely famous as the wise and understanding 
Dr. Cliff Huxtable on The Cosby Show. The program was one of the most watched in America during its run from 1984 to 1992. Cosby's estimated worth was more than $400 million at one point. But his career collapsed as the accusations against him increased. I'm Brian Lynn. Officials at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill approved tenure for Pulitzer Prize-winning reporter Nicole Hannah-Jones. The decision came after weeks of tension and protests at the school and around the country. Tenure guarantees lifetime employment at a college or university. It can offer protection to professors who express their political and cultural opinions publicly. UNC Board of Trustees voted 9 to 4 to award tenure at a special meeting Wednesday. Part of the meeting was closed to the public, which caused protests by supporters of Hannah Jones. Today we took another important step in creating an even better university, Jean Davis, a member of the board, said after the vote was announced. We welcome Nicole Hannah Jones back to Chapel Hill. Davis said that by awarding tenure to Hannah Jones, UNC was showing its commitment to the university's highest values of free speech and diversity of all types. The university had announced in April that it had hired Hannah Jones. It offered her a five-year contract to lead the race and investigation journalism program at the school. The leadership position usually comes with tenure, but it was not offered to Hannah Jones. Last week, Hannah Jones said she would not report for work unless she was awarded tenure. Officials then called the meeting to discuss the situation after weeks of protest. Hannah Jones said in a statement Wednesday evening that she was honored and grateful for the support she received in her fight for tenure. She said that receiving tenure is about more than just her. The fight, she said, was about guaranteeing the journalistic and academic freedom of black writers, researchers, teachers, and students. I'm Susan Shand. In the United States... Summer is a time when students can have fun, rest, and relax, at least those not attending summer school. In many countries around the world, summer is also a time to take long vacations or short trips to beautiful places. In today's Everyday Grammar, we will explore the grammar of rest relaxation, and summer fun. You will learn how the verb have plays a central part in describing fun times. Let's begin with a few important ideas. Have is an unusual verb. It can act as a main verb, as in... We had fun! Or it can act as an auxiliary verb... As in, I have visited this place many times. For today's report, let's only explore have in its use as a main verb. One common structure is have 
plus a noun phrase. A noun phrase is a group of words that act like a noun in a sentence. Have plus a noun phrase can mean to own or possess something, but it can also have other meanings that are very commonly used. Many of these meanings express fun and relaxation. When people go on trips or even have time to relax at home, they are often more careful about preparing and eating meals. Students who do not have to hurry to school may be more likely to have a big breakfast, or perhaps families on trips take more care to have large dinners. In any of these cases, the structure have plus a noun phrase can mean to eat or drink something. For example, a person might say any of the following. Do you want to have lunch? I'd like to have a snack. Have plus a noun phrase can take on other meanings, too. One meaning is to enjoy something. So, young people could describe a situation in which they had fun, or had a good time, or even had a blast. The three statements are nearly the same in meaning, with have a blast being the strongest statement of them all. Consider this example. How was your day? Did you play with your friends? Yes, I went to Teddy's house, and we had a blast. What did you do? We set fire to a... You did what? Just kidding. On summer trips, families and others finally get a chance to do something fun or different. This leads us to the final meaning of have plus a noun phrase, to get a chance or the time to do something. The most common expressions are have a chance or have time. Consider these two examples. When I go on summer vacation, I will have a chance to read books and play video games. When I take a vacation from work, I will have time to see friends and go hiking. While the examples we explored today are about summer vacations or trips, you can use these structures to talk about all kinds of fun and relaxing times and activities. English grammar can be fun, especially when you use grammar lessons to talk about great times. I'm John Russell. VOA Learning English presents America's Presidents. Today we are talking about Woodrow Wilson. He served two terms, from 1913 to 1921, and led the United States through the First World War. Wilson might have seemed an unlikely war president. He was a university professor before he entered politics. And when the conflict began in Europe in 1914, Wilson strongly rejected the idea of the U.S. getting involved. He even campaigned for his second term on the slogan, He Kept Us Out of the War. But Wilson's idealism eventually made him believe the U.S. must enter the conflict. He famously said, The world must be safe for democracy. He spent the last months of his presidency fighting to create a League of Nations that would prevent future wars. Wilson did not succeed in that effort, but the effects of his presidency are still seen today in both the domestic and foreign affairs of the United States. Woodrow Wilson was born in the state of Virginia in 1856 and grew up in the South. 
Wilson's father was a Protestant Christian minister who supported the views of the Confederacy during the Civil War. Wilson's mother had been born in England, but raised in the United States. She was reportedly warm and loving, especially to her husband and four children. Wilson's early life was marked by poor health and a passion for learning. His education included tutoring by Confederate soldiers, classes with his father, a year at Davidson College, a bachelor's degree from the school now called Princeton, one year of law school, and a doctoral degree in history and political science from the University of Johns Hopkins. He remains, so far, the only president with a Ph.D. Wilson's academic interests were in government and how it could be most effective. Even as a young man, he supported the idea of a strong executive, either a prime minister or a president. He wrote a number of books, including a biography of George Washington and a history of the United States. He also taught popular classes at several colleges, including Bryn Mawr in Pennsylvania, Wesleyan in Connecticut, and Princeton in New Jersey. In time, Wilson became the president of Princeton. He made major reforms to the school until some faculty and alumni resisted his efforts. Wilson had always been interested in political power. The Democratic Party in New Jersey became interested in Wilson when they were looking for a candidate with an honest public image. In truth, party officials believed he would be a weak leader whom they could influence. Wilson surprised them by winning the seat as New Jersey governor easily and then rejecting their efforts to control him. He went on to pass major reform legislation in New Jersey that reduced corruption and protected the rights of workers. His actions drew the attention of Democratic Party leaders seeking a candidate for president in 1912. Voters did not overwhelmingly choose Wilson in 1912. Although he did well in the Electoral College, he earned only a little more than 40% of the popular vote. Other votes were mostly divided between two former presidents, Theodore Roosevelt and William Taft. Yet, Wilson quickly asserted authority over Congress and pushed through a number of laws aimed at dramatic reform. Historian Kendrick Clements at the University of South Carolina says, Wilson had a strongly progressive vision. He was interested in expanding economic opportunity for people at the bottom of society and eliminating special privileges enjoyed by the richest and most powerful members of society. One of Wilson's most important acts was to create a new federal agency called the Federal Reserve Board. It still regulates American banks, credit, and money supply. He also created the Federal Trade Commission to ensure fair business practices and the Department of Labor to protect workers' rights. And he supported laws to reduce working hours for railroad employees, bar child labor, and offer government loans to farmers. But even during Wilson's busy lawmaking, the threat of world war demanded his attention. Wilson had declared that the U.S. would remain neutral in the growing conflict between the Allied and Central Powers. One of his reasons was that people in the U.S. were immigrants from the countries that were at war. Wilson did not want the conflict to divide Americans. However, he permitted international trade, 
including with Britain and France. As a result, many believed the U.S. was favoring those countries. In 1915, a German submarine sank a British ship called the Lusitania and killed more than 100 Americans on board. Wilson protested several times to Germany about the sinking. He warned that the U.S. would not accept another such aggression. But two years later, Germany attacked U.S. commercial ships. It also invited Mexico to enter into an alliance against the United States. At the beginning of Wilson's second term in office, he asked Congress to declare war on Germany. The U.S. entered World War I on the side of the Allied powers. The additional support came at an important time. American soldiers were able to help resist German troops in France. In time, Germany asked for an armistice, an agreement to stop fighting. Following the war, Wilson had a grand vision for how to gain lasting peace in Europe. He proposed that the countries that had won the war not punish Germany. Wilson also wanted European colonies to rule themselves and other areas be given immediate independence. Most importantly, Wilson suggested a League of Nations that would guarantee the member countries independence and safety. But few world leaders agreed with his plan completely. Even in the U.S., many Republican lawmakers in Congress resisted Wilson's idea for a League of Nations. Some strongly objected to any treaty that would limit the country's independence. Others did not want the country to be involved in world issues at all. So Wilson began a trip across the U.S. to raise public support for the League of Nations. He traveled more than 15,000 kilometers in 22 days and gave 29 speeches. Wilson's doctors warned him that the trip was hard on his health. But Wilson was firm about pressuring Senate Republicans to adopt the agreement. Finally, he collapsed from exhaustion. Shortly after, he suffered a major stroke. Although he recovered somewhat, he remained partly paralyzed. He rarely appeared in public again. Instead, Wilson communicated to Congress through his wife. When Republicans changed the treaty to deal with their concerns, Wilson told his supporters to reject it. In the end, the U.S. never did join the League of Nations. When a new president, Warren Harding, was sworn in in 1921, Edith and Woodrow Wilson retired to a house in Washington, D.C. Three years later, the former president died quietly there, finally at peace. I'm Kelly Jean Kelly. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson.